Um, the circumstances leading to his dismissal from the army uh, and what happened to him subsequently. But the other topics that he can talk about, we would not address today. Uh, thank you, Council. Point is well noted. You may proceed. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Barr, may I remind you that you're still under oath? Yes, sir. And everything you say should be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yes, sir. Good. So you are telling us about the meeting at Yundum Barracks on November 10th. Yes. And uh, you explained some of the statements that were made by the council members. Do you recall what time you left Yundum Barracks? We left, uh, we left the Union Barracks within uh, five to six, five to six. Uh, do you recall whether your group went to Fajara Barracks as well? That day. Or, or another day? No, 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 no. I didn't, I didn't go to Fajara Barracks. And equally, Bab Karjata didn't go to Fajara Barracks. So where did you go at the conclusion of the meeting at Yindom Barracks? From there, <coughs> I went back to Banju together with Babu Karajata. And what happened after that? From there, we were there for a while, then he, I pick, uh, he picked up his things. Uh, we closed for the day, and we went back home. Then he was living in Banju I went with, uh, with him up to Banju We dropped him. I equally continue, I continue with the driver to the camp where myself and the driver is living. Who was the driver at this time? Uh, Sergeant Jango, uh, Ngom, Sergeant Ngom, Ngom, yeah. And uh, what happened for the rest of that evening? All right, uh, as, we, uh, as I said, as we arrived at the camp, we are there, until around 10 o'clock, 10 at night, when someone knocked at my door, when I opened, I found out that it was Ibrahim Asise and then Alaji Kanye, informing me that I should prepare and get to the camp that night. When I asked you, what... Where, where was your residence? Bahamas. At Bahamas. Yes. So Alaji Kanye and, and Ibrahim Assisi yes. came to you and tell you that you should go to the camp. Yes. Uh, did they say why? Yeah, I further asked what for. They said no. They were only instructed to inform people living in the camp to go to uh, the, uh, the camp. Those living at Bahamas at the time, all of us to report at the camp. I said, well... Ibrahim Masise, what was his rank? He was a private soldier. Where is he now? Uh, before I left, he was at the State House, so I don't know now. At the State House, yeah. okay, good. So I said, look, uh, I have no cause to go to 1BN this time, uh, this time around, especially at night. I'm no more at 1BN. I'm transferred to one battalion, uh, sorry, Army Headquarters. So I have no cause to go to 1BN. And what happened after that? From there, they said, look, it's an, you know, it's, it's an inf instruction that is given to them. I said, look, I'm not going. No, I then went inside my house, pulled out my gun. Then they all march out. I locked my door. So I was there for a while. I told the wise to sneak and go to Banjulunding to inform Bab Karjata accordingly, being my commander and been his oddly. But what were you going to inform him about? That he should not go to the camp that night. But why? At this stage, did you know what was happening? Uh, uh, of course, yes, I know. As I told you previously, or before I left on the 8th, there are rumors of, you know, coup plots. So obviously, I know that is what is on the making. But you mentioned Alaji Kanye. Yes. Was Alaji Kanye part of this? 11-11. Uh, yes. Yes, he was part of it. We, okay. we are just surprised that, you know, the, that morning how he just U-turned, you know, and then 
started behaving the way he was behaving, it was a surprise to everyone. Okay, so you decided at this stage to sneak out of the camp to go to Babu Karjata at Banjulding? Yes. Can you tell us what happened after that? So when I reached uh, at, at his uh, Babu Karjata residence, I knocked his door, you know, he moved the curtain to see who is actually knocking. He found out that it is me. He opened the door. He said, Ba, what happens? I said, Sir, don't go to the camp. Things are not normal at the camp at this point in time. So even if you are called, don't go. He said, I wanted to go, but he said, Ba, no. Why can't you spend the night here? I said, no. He said, no, stay, stay here. I said, no, I'm going back. My duty is to come and inform you. This is the commander of the army you yes. are talking to? Yes. At this stage, he was a colonel, wasn't he? Yes. And you were a private soldier. Exactly. He's orderly for that matter. Yes. And you wouldn't obey instructions? Not necessarily obeying instructions like, you know. My duty was to, you know, once he's in the office, I'll be with him in his house. Did his he private. say it as an order or it was just a suggestion? No, it was a, not an order. It is a suggestion that I should spend the night in his house. Would you have disobeyed if it was an order? If it was an order, well, I would have obeyed. I've obeyed. So you told him this time around that you are not yes. going to stay. You would have to go back. Yes. He agreed to that. He agreed, yes. And then what happened? And he left that? me go as I was going because I used the back back road, PTS, if you are familiar with that ground. I used the back road to go back to the camp. As soon as I reached PTS, you know, I saw... Uh, what is PTS? PTS, Police Training School. Proceed, please. All right. As I reached there, I saw Basil Baro's car coming towards me. It was, his car was very obvious. Everybody knows it. It was a Pajero with a flashlight on top. When I saw it at a distance, you know, I put one and one together. That is... I should take cover somewhere because to avoid him seeing me at that point in time. Then I, I dashed down. Why did you not want him to see you? Because like if, he, if I should you know, stand up until he reaches me, he would have stopped and said, bah, get inside. And I have no other option. I have to get inside. At this stage, did you know why Basiru Baro was at the camp? No, I don't know because I didn't speak to him. I don't know. What time of the day or the evening was this? No, this was at night around, because immediately these people left my house, I rose to Banyul, and then this would be between 11 towards 12. 11 towards 12, yeah. 11 towards midnight? Yeah. And then what happened after that? You and dashed I, down? I dashed down, you know, I lied down on the, in the, inside the grass until he come and pass me, until I cannot see the vehicle anymore. Then I get up, I start maneuvering, to my house. When I reach what my house, what does maneuvering entail? Like you know, you cannot just run like blindly like that. You have to take some pace and then stop and then observe whether somebody somewhere is observing at you. Then you take from there again. This is what we call maneuvering. So until I reach my house, I open my house. I went inside, still in uniform. Okay, I took all my weapons, my webbing, I brought them at the, you know, we have a, uh, at my sitting room, we have a camp bed, a small bed, camp bed. I said, let me just relax here. As soon as I lie down, I think that's where God was waiting. Thank God, that's what saved me. I slept that night, so the God knows. You know, as soon as six o'clock, my watch alarm, you know, I, I started to come up. Uh, that night, there was a lot of gunshot yes, in the camp. I understand, yes. You slept all through? I slept the whole night, honest you, to my You mind. did not even wake up? I, didn't, I did not wake up. The that is your story? That's my story. That is what you want the commission to and believe? And this is exactly what happens. Okay? I continue? Yes, yes, all right. proceed. So, please. When I wake up, I went to the bathroom, washed my face, 
of my teeth bros. How did you know there was lots of gunshots that night? Like, uh, as soon as I stepped out of my house, you know, somebody was hiding at my, at my where my, my wife normally cook, it's called chimney. You know, that's where somebody was hiding there who never noticed my presence in the house. So when I opened the door, he just looked at me and saw that I am the person, you know, he jumped up and said, hey, when the whole you are sleeping here? I said, yes. He said, the camp is terrible, you know. I said, let's go back. He said, where no. was your wife at this stage? Well, they have evacuated my wife. Who evacuated your wife? Myself. At what stage did you evacuate your wife? Well, as, I, as soon as I knew things are not right, you know, and something is going to happen, I evacuated my wife. Was this before you went to Babu Karjata? Yes, before I, went, before I went to Babu Karjata. What did you explain to your wife? Well, I said, I told her that, well, things are not right, and then the way I'm seeing things, it could be, it could be very dirty, you know. So the best thing is go and live with your parents for the meantime. If you still hear that I'm alive, then that's it. If you still hear that I'm dead, then that's it. Yes. And where did you get the weapon from? I, w I will still maintain my weapon since 21st July, uh, sorry, 22nd July. That weapon, I still maintain that weapon. You didn't return it to the armory? No, because we are living in the camp and then you know, we were asked to keep our rifles in our, in our, uh, in our house. Mr. You were asked to keep your rifles with, instead of returning them to the armory? Yes, because it was revolution time, and then you need to have your weapon by your side. I was still maintaining my rifle. That is your testimony? Yes, yes, yes. Soldiers were allowed to keep their weapons? After they 1994, did not... those who are living in the camp could. Okay? I'm not saying old soldiers, because some of them are living in town. So obviously somebody living in town will not be able to, but those living in the camp were asked to maintain their weapons. That's your testimony? Yes. Right. Okay, so you had your weapon? So, you know, you know, when I told him, let's go back, he said, you, you are crazy. I'm telling you the camp is terrible. You are asking me to go back. I said, yes. He said, for him, he's not going. You know, then I started moving out. This was after six o'clock to us. So when I reached the bar gate, I met uh, Keba Drame, who was at the point on sentry at the bar gate. He stopped me. And you had your weapon at this yes, time? Yes, yes, yes. And then he halted me. I stopped. He said, where are you coming from? I said, I'm com from, coming from my house. He said, uh, he was, he was instructed that nobody should go in and out. I said, well, I don't know what's going to happen. I have to go inside. I'm living in the camp here. If there's anything going wrong, I have all right to be there. He asked me to stop. I pushed the door and then proceed. He asked me to stop. I refused. I said, look, you have your weapon. Fire. If it doesn't work, I pay back. This is exactly what I said. Then I continue moving. You too, you were very confident. You had your African course, yes, electronics. Well, I, I was confident, to be quite honest, because you, this is you knew either life Afri or death. These are the only two things. It's either you, life. You knew your African electronics would work? Uh, well, I'm not so yet, because I didn't receive any fire yet. But I was just trying to prove it, whether it is, it is going to work. I said, yes, you have your weapon. Shoot, if you want. If it doesn't work, I pay back. And I passed it. I went. As soon as I reached the guard room, you know, I can see Sana Sabali, it was Singate, you know, Haidara, uh, Lefna Haidara, and then Yankuba Ture, you know, this guy, how do you call it? Sana Sabali was having a list in his hand calling names that anybody you see, any of these officers, shoot them and kill them, you have no case to answer. Which names did he call out? Lefna Nsei, Lefna Lamine Dabo, Lieutenant Buba Jame, Lieutenant Elef Jame, uh, how do you call it? Can I go by my record? I have some. Um, 
well, try to recollect. Yes. And uh, no, just just try to recollect. Okay. If As I, I, I said, left nan say. Uh huh. Uh, uh, how do you call it? Left nan buwa jamme. Uh huh. Left nan lamin dabo. Left nan ablay ba a chopin chopi. Then you have uh, Bakar Mane, Alliance Nyancho, uh, LF Jame. Now this, these are names that I can fully recall. And what time was this? This was after seven o'clock, because then it was not that much bright. When you see a figure, you can know that it is a figure, but you could not be able to recognize exactly who the person was. But as the problem I have with that mm -hmm. is at that stage, many of these people you have mentioned have already been arrested. Buba Jame was arrested at the night. A chopping. Yeah. Well, the Liba it could, it was could also be, arrested. but their names was on the list. It could be, but they, their names were pronounced. And uh, let me finish. Mm -hmm. um, Mane Nyancho was also arrested. Aliuba arrested. Why would Sana Sabali say if anybody sees them and fires at them? They have no case to answer. Yeah, because maybe they believe uh, they might believe that these are the people who are the ringleaders, who are the ringleaders. But why would he say that if these people were already in custody, in his own custody? Why would he say that? That's what I'm saying. I'm saying that I didn't know at the time whether they were arrested, but these names were on the list and he was pronouncing names. Okay? All right. Yeah. Proceed. Then we were there for a while after seven o'clock it was eight. You know, you know they ordered uh, for uh, Fafanyan to be removed from the cell. At this stage did you see any vehicles Okay. Parked, yeah, yeah. parked right. anywhere right. around that. Yes, I saw a vehicle around the guard room. And what type of a vehicle? A truck, a military truck. And then equally, Sana was saying that, look at them. Uh, they want to be presidents. They want to be president. You can see them in the truck. Who so was he referring to? Do you know? Is, uh, Left them Baro, Basiru, and then Dotfal. Already soldiers were climbing or peeping. I had the preview to go and climb and then peep. I saw them, they are all lying down, motionless, they are dead. Okay? After that, you know, Edward asked uh, Kanye to go and bring Fafanya. So he was coming with Fafanyang, pushing him, you know, asking him to run until at the ante room. Between the ante room and the cookhouse, they asked him to run for his life, for Fafanyang, Fafanyang to run for his life. You know, hands were tied behind, you know, with pants. You know, as he was running, looking behind, you know, then Edwards first fired at, at him. He fell down. He wanted to get up again. Somebody by his side, which I later realized that it was Lamin Kuli, also finished him. Let's take it a bit slowly. Yeah. Where were you at this stage? I was standing at the ante room. You were seeing things clearly? Yes. Koli, how far was him away from uh, Mr. Nyang, Fafa Nyang? 
Look, uh, this was a, a group of people, Fafonya is in front. He was asked to run for his life. Everybody was behind him. We are all behind him. Okay, Edu fired first, followed by... Uh, sorry, excuse me. Uh, where was Edu standing? Use this space to tell okay. us who like, was standing where. This was the ante room, okay? There is a pathway, there is a road that leads to Cook House. Hmm? Edu was just standing right in front of the office door. And then the rest of us were all behind him in group. So he asked Fafanyan to run for his life. So on that pathway towards the cookhouse. Which direction? That direction or towards my direction? No, this direction. Because the ante room is on your left and then the cookhouse is on the right. So there's a pavement between the cookhouse and the ante room. So that's the road he should take and then run for his life. That's where it was sought him and then... Uh, I understand the, how you explain the geography. I want you to use this space and explain the positions uh, such that we would have a good understanding of what happened. Okay. Uh, the way you've just described it, it's like Fafanyang was, shoot, was shot w whilst he was running behind you where you were standing. Well, he was running in front of us. Can you use this space to show who was standing where? Okay, like this table, okay? Like, we are all standing at this table here, facing you, okay? And Fafanya was asked to run for his life. Towards which direction? Towards your direction, okay? So as he stepped off, he was you know, in the form of a run, but not that much, because somebody who is on his study, you know, you cannot have the, you know, the strength to run that, that far. So as he st stepped off, you know, he was running, you know, looking behind, a shot came from Edu. Ed, who, who is Edu? Edward Singate. What was his rank at this Lieutenant day? Edward Singate. Okay. Yeah, a shot came from Lieutenant Singate. Pow. He fell down. He got up. Koli also shoot at him. At this stage, where was Koli? Koli was standing there. Among the... Amongst your group? Yes. Did he make a move towards Fafanyang? If it will be a move, maybe a standing position or a firing position, but not like run towards him, no. If he might take a position, probably a standing position, whereby you have to suit your left foot forward to have a, at least a balance of your, your weight. Did, did you see him aim his weapon at Fafanyang? No, I didn't see him. After the shot, mm -hmm. when I do, you know, once a weapon is fired, that, you know, smoke comes out. So that smoke, where it comes, that's why I glance, I realized that it is so, his weapon that was fired. In order to make that shot, what did he have to do? As a soldier, can you tell us what Kohli had to do in order to make that shot? What are the steps he must take in order to make that shot? As I said, you must have to send your left foot forward to balance yourself and then take aim. And then sort. So he must have taken a shooting position. Exactly, a, f a standing, not squatting down, standing position. And then, and then he fired. He aimed his of course weapon. It was an aim sort. And then he would have to pull the trigger. Yes. And that would be a deliberate shot. Of course, yes. It was a deliberate one. Intentionally to kill. Yes. That's your testimony. That's my testimony. Uh, what do you say to the suggestion? that the shot coming out of Kohli's weapon was accidental? No, 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 I deny that. I definitely deny it. Why do you deny that? Because if, the, if it is an accidental shot, he would not have landed, uh, hit his target. He would not have hit his target. There are procedures in firing, all right? You must have to look through the, you know, foresight blade, foresight blade, okay, to the front tip of the front side uh, blade, to the target. You have to inline these things in order to hit your weapon. AK-47 is not just like any other weapon. By 
looking at you where I am, unless if I am somebody who is a marksman, I can just like sorry, you no, know, you know, rapid fire. That one does not need that much aim. It's just point your muscle where the target is, and then you spray. Then along the line, because when you bust, it goes with about five, five rounds will go at the same time. Without releasing it, it will continue firing. So in that, I would say, but if not, you have to aim your target and hit your target, then you get it. You can't say it's an accident. That is not an accident. Uh, the evidence, we, one of the testimony we received here is that Koli was running towards Fafanyang in order to help save him because he was shot. If you look at the... Uh, uh, let me finish. Okay, okay. He had his gun slung over his shoulder. And as he was running, the, there was accidental discharge and it hit Fafanyang on the, on the jaw. What do you say to that? That is totally wrong. Is that possible? No, that is not possible. Because a weapon that is slim, mm. all right, if there is an accidental fire or a negligent discharge, ND we call it, then you either wound yourself or the, you know, the shot will land somewhere very close to you. But it cannot travel and go and hit somebody. That is not possible. It's not possible. No. If I were to tell you that the testimony I have just described come from Koli, what would you say to that? No, Koli is just trying to build a cover-up, but if I was him, I would have said I, I suit him. If I was him in his suit. Essentially, you're saying he lied. Of course, yes. To cover himself. Of course, yes. From responsibility. I'm telling you, if I was him, I would have said, yes, I killed him. Yes. Saying an accident discharge. That is not a true story. So you, Emelba, standing there on that day of November 11, you knew that Koli finished Fafanyang deliberately. Yeah. That's your testimony. That's my testimony. Under oath. Under oath. What happened after that? And from there, you know, things started unfolding again. All right. After, from there, I moved towards the garden. Then I saw Bab Karjata walk into the camp. How he came, I don't know. So when he arrived, I went and approached him. I said, sir, good morning, sir. He said, yes. I said, sir, last night your driver was overcome. That is Ngom, Sergeant Ngom, that he's inside the cell. He said, I should go and make arrangement for his release. And I went to the guard room. I met uh, many soldiers there. Uh, I spoke to this guy, how do you call it? Buba Jame. He was the duty provo then, that night. Which, which Buba Jame are you Kalin, referring to? Kalinlai, Kalinlai. All right? So I told Kalinlai that, look, I'm a commander said you should release this uh, Bab Karungom. His driver is not part of it. Then he requested the chief from Batch, then he opened the cell. Which I, Batch are you referring to? Sambajalo. Then this, he called his name, he walked out from the lot, and then he came out. I asked him to go and dress up in his house and then bring the Babkarjada's car along. And what happened after that? As soon as he left, we were there. For a while, briefly, the council members, they left again to bind towards Banjul. Later, they came back. This will be around in the afternoon, 12 upwards. When they came also, there was an arrangement for a, a vehicle. All right, a jeep was brought in front of the guard room parked in front of the garum and then these names were called as I mentioned it earlier on. The cell was open, Lieutenant C was called, 
and then followed by Buwajame, Bakar Bakarmane, Lamindabo, Ablai Bah. Yeah, I, uh, let's get the names again properly. Yeah, Jeff will say you said. Yes. Followed by who else? Buwajame. Buwajame. Lefna Buwajame, Lefna Lamindabo, Suso. Lamindabo? Yes. Mm -hmm. and then. Lamindabo, does he have a nickname? Lamindabo. Yes. Yes, he has a nickname. What was the nickname? Suso. Suso. Yeah, we are all from the same village. He's from Bre. I'm from Bre. Okay. He's called Suso. Uh, you have Ablai Ba, mm -hmm. a chopping, chopping. A chopping, chopping. Mm -hmm. Then you have uh, who else? OCDT Kedek Silla, Amadou Silla. Kedek Silla, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. And who else? These five, I can remember seeing them boarding the vehicle. And then what happened after that? Then as soon as they boarded the vehicle, to my surprise this time around, I should have gone with Babu Karjata, but Sorry, something happens before we uh, they depart. As I said, as soon as Babu Karjata walked in, I told him about his driver. He went, he asked me to go and negotiate his release. When he was released, I came back to him. You know what he told me? He said, Ba, you are from data in Tobang. What does that mean? He said, Ba, do you think you are not also part of these people? I said, Sir, what do you mean? He said, the cool leader is from Jara, so I'm also from Jara. I said, sir, but if I'm part of it, then you are also part of it. He said, ah, but why do you say that? I said, I'm working directly under you. So, you know, we are not far from council members. Sana Sabal had to look back and then see us. He smiled. Maybe him doesn't know the role I played in 1994. Uh, uh, 1994. But Sana knew what I did. So mayor, the mere fact that saying that Koya Mirete Dati Nyin Tobang, and I also responded to him with, with that, you know, maybe it does not go down well with him. This was why when they were leaving to go out of the barrack, he left me inside the camp. That was a surprise to me. But it does not matter. To myself, to me, I'm trying to save, save my own life in this, issue, in this case. You are seeing people, they are taking people out. You don't know where they are taking them. And you are also telling me that I am part of them. Which I also, you know, reply that if I am part of it, you are also part of it. Uh, we have received testimony. Yeah. That in the morning, while people were watching or going to look at the bodies that were in the truck, somebody went up the truck and realizing that Dot Fall was not completely dead, he finished him off. Finished him up in the truck? In while Dot Fall's body was in the truck. No, the time I'm seeing Dot Fall, he was completely dead. The time you saw him, he yes. was completely yes. dead? Yes. So you did not know anything about somebody having to climb up no, the truck no, to finish no, him off? No, no, no. So you have this, you had this altercation or this conversation with Babu Karjata. Yes. And uh, he left. Yes. Without you. Yes. He's orderly. Yes. You remained behind. Yes. What happened afterwards? You we said they out. returned in the afternoon. Yes, when they came back in the afternoon. Did you see them when they returned? I yes. want to know who returned. Yes, I saw them. The council member, they all came back, including Babu Karjata himself. You said, quote, council members, yes. they all came back, including Babu Karjata. Yes. Unquote. That is yes. exactly what you said. Yes, yes. Tell us which council members you saw. Lieutenant Sana Sabali, Lieutenant Edward Singate, Lieutenant Haidara, and then Yanko Bature, including Babu Karjata. Yes. Sorry, you saw all of them? Yes. Did you see any other senior military officers present there who were not members of the council? If there is any, it is Babu Karjata. If there is any, 
at that point in time is Bob Karijata. He is the only one you can recall? I can recall, yes. I can remember. Do you know a person called Peter Singate? Oh, yeah. Sorry. Though he's all along with his brother. Could you say that again? I'm, what I'm saying, Peter is always with his brother, Edward Singate. They are always together. Always. Uh, that may be the case, but was he present yes, on he this was particular present. day? I just forgot to mention his name. He is present. He was present. Yes. Uh, now let's talk about their entourage, those, the members of the entourage who were present. Yeah. Tell us who. As I said, Lieutenant Sanasabali, Lieutenant Edward Singate. You've mentioned the council members okay. who were present. Okay. You said all of them, yeah. and you listed them. Okay. Among senior officers, you mentioned you mentioned one, and you confirmed another. Yes. That was uh, Ita Singate. Uh, Singate yes. and Jata. Yes. So now let's talk about their entourage, okay. their their orderlies. The orderlies, uh, JCB Mendy is there. Lamin Marung is there. Bach Sambajalo is there. Jai Ponkal is there. What I mean, Diche Babu Karanjai, Ebi Njai. You know, they were all there. And this Churo, Mustafa, also is there. And then, yes. So Foyan Kubature, who was there? Foyan Kubature. I think I have forgot, unless I, I go through my, because I also prepared some. Uh, yes, I want you to testify without looking okay. at it. It's not a memory test, but. Yeah. So far, I think uh, these are people that I've seen. Others uh, are there whom I cannot remember. Uh, earlier, you mentioned Esa Mendy. Esa Mendy, yes, he's an oddly to Yanko Bature. But was he present or was he not? Of course, he was present. Uh, you mentioned. Njai Dichep, yes. Njai Ponkal. Yes. We received testimony that he wasn't there on the second trip because he was injured and was taken to hospital or was allowed to go home. What do you say to that? I, I, no, I, I dispute to that. I dispute to that. Okay, you can't say anything about that. Okay. So you saw all these people there? Yes. And what happened that afternoon? When they came back, you know, in a convoy form, the convoy went, you know, guard room, turn right, sorry, left, up to the ante room. Vehicles were parked, and then the Land Rover was driven between the ante room and the cookhouse. That's where the Land Rover was parked. But the way and the manner you can see his escort can simply tell you that something, you know, serious have gone on. Okay. Uh, let's take a step back. Before this statement you've just made, you told us that people were called out of the guard room and they were put in this land room. They left. Do you know to which direction they headed? Yeah, you can see the convoy taking Brikama Highway towards Brikama. All the council members went yes. with this convoy, yes. that's what you said? Yeah. Abukar Jata, did he go with the convoy? Yes, he go with them. This time round, he again left you behind? Yes. That's did he I see was. you? Huh? Did he see you? I was standing with him. In the normal circumstances, he should have even used his official car. But this time around, he didn't go with his official car. He went, he joined the council member's car and then left with them. And he left me there. When they were leaving, did you know where they were going? No, I don't know where they were going. I don't know. Because there's nothing mentioned like that, no. You mentioned that it was Bubajame Kanilai and Bach 
who opened the cell and allowed Jangom to, to, to be released. Ngom, Ngom. Ngom, excuse yeah. me, to be released. Uh, what happened to them, Kanilai and Bach? Oh, nothing happens to them. Did they remain in the camp? No, or, no, no, no. Or did they As, go with no, the convoy? No, they went with. They went with the convoy. Because Tell can, me who who, who went can, with the convoy. I can see uh, Boba Jame was in front of the Land Rover. The driver I cannot remember now, but Kanye was behind the Land Rover as they were leaving. So, so it is your testimony that Boba Jame, aka Kanilai, yes. was in the front of the Land Rover. Yes, and. Alaji Kanyi was behind the Land Rover. Behind the, Land the Rover. back of the Land Rover. Yes, yes. That's your testimony? Yes, that's my testimony. They left and they came back. Yes. How long did it take for them to return? Maybe approximately two hours. Two hours, maybe. So let's say around 4 p.m considering they returned yeah. ar around one after yeah, because, one. Because uh, we left the camp, you know, it was five, heading to office, yes, around that time. So they returned around four? Something like that. And uh, you said they drove in a convoy and went and parked and around the anteroom. anteroom. Yes. Tell us what happened after All right. that. So uh, as I said, the Land Rover was parked between the cookhouse and the anteroom. So, how do you call it? I didn't go to the Land Rover to see what is happening there, but I can see, you know, people inside. I can see dead bodies inside, because you can see leaves were put on top of them. And also, because uh, Sami Jose is a very tall guy, you can see legs there. Yeah. What happened after that? Then from there, the council members, nearly they left the anteroom, they went up to around the fence, after the cookhouse, around the fence, where we normally have a, a big soccer way. They went up to that area. To my own, you know, understanding that they might map out an area where they're going to bury these people. They went up to that, you know, soccer way, they stood there for about two, three minutes. Then they came back. And as soon as they came back, you see a group of soldiers around that end. I was at the ante room, but still I can see them. I see a group of, group of soldiers, whether they were digging or what. But to me, I thought probably in the, that soccer way, that's where their, boy, their, their remains were buried. But according to testimonies I'm hearing that they were, you know, you know, they dug, you know, grave for them to be buried. All right. Myself, I went with the investigator to that ground to show them exactly where I thought it could have been there. But the environment was totally changed to me. And then because I found something there that I did not left there before. That was a trench that was dug exactly where the soccer way is. So what eventually happened to the bodies? Uh, well, I'm quite sure they might be buried. Did you see the burial? No, I did not see the burial. I did not witness the buried. burial. But can you tell those who were involved in the burial? Well, you can, you can, uh, you know, Kanye can in those days is just like a crazy guy, you know. You cannot predict the type of person he was. He was all alone there at the burial ground, because I can see he's a tall guy, wherever he is, you can be able to spot him among the lot. I know he was there, and the Buba Jame, but the rest, probably the... Which Buba Jame are you referring to? Kalilai. Kalilai. Yes. He was there? He was there. He participated? Of course, yes. Uh, apart from, you talked about seeing the bodies of Dotfal and Baro. Yeah. You talked about the killing of Fafanyang. Yeah. You also talked about uh, the removal of certain officers from the guard room 
they went towards Birkama. They came back with dead bodies two hours later. Yeah. Did you see any other killing in Yundum Barracks? Yes. Uh, I did not see it eye to eye, but I had gone shot, and I am quite sure he must have been killed. That is uh, Basil Kamara. Uh, because immediately they arrive while others are busy digging there. We are going to the guard room when we meet along with Alaji Kanyi, equally with Edward Singate, coming towards the ante room, you know, towards the cookhouse when Basiru Kamara is in front of them, also tied in pants. You know, until around cookhouse end, I had multiple shots. I presume that he was killed. And I didn't see him since then, I didn't see him again. Do you know who fired those shots? Well, if you may ask me, I would say it's, it's Edward and this guy, how to call it, Alaji Kanye. That's what I'm, I believe. That is just a belief. Yeah, that's a belief, yes. But you do not have first hand information no, about it. I don't that. have first hand to see actually who shot or no. But I believe that these two guys must have because it is multiple shot. Pow pow. So obviously speaking, this is two people who are fi who fired. And do you know what happened? Well, you did not see that body, no, so you no, would not no, know. I did not see that body. All right. And that day, what time did you leave the camp? We leave the camp uh, very late, after five to us, six after five anyway. Went back to you. Did place. you leave alone? No, I live together with Babu Karyata this time around, with his officer car, including his driver. As soon as we take off the camp, we are going. Uh, he had to you know, remind me again, saying, Ba, Fonga me for man die, ba. As we are going back to Banyu, he told me, Ba, what I told you, didn't, didn't you not like it? He said it was a joke. I said, sir, that is too expensive. That joke is too expensive. You are seeing they are taking people out, you know, going to kill them, and equally you are telling me that I'm part of it. I said, look, I'm also somebody's son. If you feel like you don't trust me anymore by your side, it's better you, remove, you, you, you return me back where you took me. It's better than, you know, you want to auction my life like this. Since then, our relationship was so, you know, with our colleague Sawa, you know, I, I that I, no, he feared me in those days, to be quite honest, because I was never happy with him. I worked under him for two good years without being promoted. A private soldier working with an army commander, is that normal? He didn't promote me. And he even tell me that, but I'm the promoter. I said, look, I'm not here for rank. Yes, I'm not here for rank. If you want, you promote. If you don't want, you leave it. You see, maybe now, what I ask my fellow colleague, in those days, I have a very, my face is very, very, you know, terrible. Because I have mustaches which are very long, you know, sometimes I roll them, you know, by looking at me, you have to have confidence to talk to me, you know. You were fearful. Oh, let me call it, that's what even saved me. That's what even saved me. Because I don't, I don't laugh that much. You know, I'm always somebody who is business-like, okay? And since then, Babukara, I don't even ask for permission. I don't even ask for favor from him. I don't even ask anything. Later on, I told him that if you feel like you are not, um, you know, you don't trust me anymore, it's better you, tr you, you get me back where you come, pick did me you, from. Did you ask to be transferred? Yes, I asked him for, for a transfer. He said, okay, I will look into it. But that's where I was until after the transition period, until 1996. Yeah. Your statement said 1995, but no, your testimony is 1996. During the transition period, two years I can remember that. So what happened after 1996, after the transition? After the transition, I went back to the, sorry, after Babu Karjada, when Babu Karjada relieved me, somebody, one of my bad men changed me, P.S. Mendy, who later changed me as an orderly to Babu Karjada. I went back to Metropolis, because then I was in the Metropolis already. 
I went back to the military police. That's where I was until 2001. I went for a special force commando training. Uh, we wouldn't go into that okay. at the moment. Okay. Uh, let's just fast forward okay. to the okay. period right. that we, uh, to okay. the period in which you were okay. removed from the army. Okay. Can uh, you tell us what happened? Yes, what uh, led to your removal from the army? I was in the military police until 2008. As a duty sergeant who was on duty that day, I received a, a call, uh, an informant who informed me that there are people around Kersirin, you know, selling drugs. All right. And I even asked him, how do you know this number? It was not, a, then telephones were, it was not my telephone number. It was a direct line in the office. All right. So when he called, I said, who are you? He introduced himself as Mama de Dabo. All right. A civilian. I told him, how do you come to know about this transaction? He said he was involved in a transac uh, translation from Arabic to uh, English. Because there is a Pakistani man who's supposed to buy drug from somebody else. And in fact, he knows where they should meet you know, in order to uh, go ahead with their deal. I said, but I, I, I don't know you. I would like to see you in passing before going, before doing, before doing any other thing. He said, okay, if you can come up to Senegambia, Senegambia, at the roundabout, he told me you'll find me there. But with all that, this information were booked in my diary because in the military police, all our activities are booked in the diary. I booked the information that I received a call informing me about a drug transaction. And my action taken is I am on going to the ground to effect arrest with one of my colleagues who was my yeah. junior man. At this stage, you were aware that f f you were military police, correct? Yes, yes. And your role was to police the army, wasn't yes. it? Yes. Uh, your role was not to carry on as a civilian policeman. No, see. Uh, we normally have that collaboration with the police. Uh, yes, that is and collaboration. Yes, and but at normally, this stage, at this stage, you were not collaborating with the police. You were going on a unilateral action. Exactly. Like. Uh, and uh, at this stage, <coughs> there was also a drug enforcement agency. Yes. There was also police stations around Kersering area. Yes. You did not report to the drug squad, did you? No, I did not. You did not report to the police station, did you? No, I did not. You took it upon yourself to deal with this matter? Yes. And it was out of your jurisdiction? It was not okay. part of your That's normal responsibilities as military police okay. to participate in this activity? Yeah. Okay, tell us what, what happened after. So oh, like, uh, when... Uh, what I was intending to do was, after effecting arrest, I take them to the nearest police station, whereby they'll be charged according to the law, and then... You're putting the cart before the horse. No, I said... Uh, you you should have reported to the police and let the police effect the arrest. No, normally... You, we... Now you want to reverse it. You want to effect the arrest and yeah. then go to the police. See, you see... But, but, but just proceed. Tell us what you did. Exactly. What I'm trying to say here is, normally during, sometimes when you're on patrol, sometimes we arrest people, we take them to the nearest police. That person. is flagrant delicto. That is different. That is when you are in the, you find somebody in the process of committing a crime. Exactly. But in this particular occasion, that was not the case. Okay. And yeah, also, the report had been made. And also, we can be called upon, you know, to assist. All right. Yes, but so. on this occasion, you are not assisting. On this occasion, you are the main actor doing the, doing the arrest. Okay. Uh, well, but, uh, but let's not argue over what should have okay. or um, could have. Yeah. Let's focus on what you did. Okay. Thank you. Now, uh, when I, you know, I came with my colleague up to the 
roundabout, we stop because the Metropolis car is very obvious. When you saw the Metropolis car, we parked alongside the road, he came out. He introduced himself that I am Mamadi Dabo, I was the one talking to you. I said, okay, but how do you come to know about it? He said he was involved in a trans, uh, translation. That's how he come to know about this deal. And I told him where actually this deal is supposed to take place. He showed me a road that if I should finish it, if I turn on my right, I will see the compound directly. I said, okay. So I told him to go home. So, though, so long you have informed us now, you can leave. I went with my colleague. Now, the moment we arrived at the compound gate, back in the car, coming down, they can see because it is transparent. It is, you know, glasses are all over. They saw our presence. So they decided to open the other gate, the back door, and then they jumped over the fence and they started running. So we also followed them, pursued them for a while. We could not arrest any one of them, and then we came back join the vehicle and go back to the Indum, Indum camp. As I arrived also, I booked my arrival that I went after the, you know, to effect arrest, but unfortunately we could not arrest anyone, okay? While I was there around uh, 6 a.m. to 7, Babu Karba, Bora Koli, Alaji, Alaji Kamara. Ba Babu Karba, uh which security outfit did he belong to? At the time, he was the one holding on the office, Metropolis office, while our PM, Glutemani, was out for a course. And the other person you mentioned, Bora the person, Bora Kuli. What outfit did he belong to? Mm. Bora Kuli is among the junglers. Where is he at the moment? I'm sorry, he's not in the country. How about the first person you mentioned? Alaji, Kanye, uh, Alaji Kamara was used to be an intelligent officer. All right, these people appeared. Three of them. Three of them. Mm. And uh, it's only Alaji Kamara who was an, not an officer at the time. Babu Kar, he was a lieutenant. Babu, lieutenant Babu Kar, pa. And then you have Captain Borakuli. So they told me that, you know, they were instructed by the CDS then, Lantom Bontamba, that I should be arrested. I said, but what happens? They said, no, it's an instruction. I said, look, you have to tell me what have I done wrong before I'm arrested. So, you know, I insisted, you know, the furthermore tell me that, you know, look, he said you went after a drug, a diamond dealer and you collected 22,000 euros. I said, well, I don't know where you get that your information, but the information I have is different. I opened the diary for them, for them to see what is, they said they are not interested in the diary. It's an order given to them, and they have to arrest me. So, you know, they asked me my pistol, I removed my pistol, and then detached the magazine and gave them the pistol. I can see they were sniffing the pistol to see whether it has been fired, and they, Subsequently, I give them the magazine too. They open the mag, they remove the rounds, count the number of rounds was eight. The number of rounds that I signed is equally the number of rounds inside my pistol. So I had them say that what Nimmon fire, I said, what, what, what are you saying? He said, the information they have is I shot, I shot the complainant on his leg and his. You know, receiving treatment at the intensive care unit at RVH. I said, wow, this is another, another thing. So nonetheless, I said, okay, so long as the issue, I will accept the arrest. I went inside the cell with my colleague, Balamusa Sidi. So we are there, that this was on Thursday, Friday, Saturday in the morning, Lantom Montamba himself drove up to the camp and asked the duty MP to open the cell. When he opened the cell, we were you know, asked to come out. Lantom Bon said, that's the first time I even hear the, uh, the name of the complainant. That is, Nalma Mamudu Sisela Kodobon Dembala Sambala Mai too. He said, if we did not take out Mamudu Sisela's money, he's going to take us to Mai too. 
which I feel was, you know, not proper, because here you are talking about senior NCOs who have served the law more than 20 years in service. If you hear something about them, you come up to the, you know, you know, in front of them, or the, you know, you brought them before you. At least you could have allowed them to, you know, listen to their side of the story. But nonetheless, he did not do that. He just came out to issue threat. You know, then that's how he left us. He went back. We are detained for a six-month period. Where were you detained? I was detained at the cells, military police cells, for six months. You know, I would call it no report that, you know, there were reports, but they were contradicting each other. But there was a report that came from Fajara Barracks, which was written by Lamin Bojan, Captain Bojan then, uh, who say, the report says that, you know, I sued the complainer on his leg. He's receiving treatment at the in intensive care unit at RVH. And also I took 11,500 11, euros, including 5,000 Gambian money. The Mutipolis, Babakar Ba himself wrote a report. The Mutipolis report says that it was 6,500 euro involved in the transaction, and I have never fired my pistol. You know, so they were contra you know, contradicting each other. You know. So what happened eventually? So this report was sent to the army quarters, you know, because we are not, you know, we are senior NCOs, non-commissioned officers. There was a meeting that was convened by the chief of defense staff then, Lanto Montamba, you know, the sta a staff meeting to, you know, to find, to ask as to how to go about with the problem. <laughs> uh, Major Bojan was calling, he was the legal advisor to the army then. When he was called, they give him both reports, he went through the report, he said the, the reports are contradicting. You know, he write another, letter to the military police saying that the matter need to be reinvestigated and then you know to certain how much money is involved and who did the shooting so when that letter came in you know I had the preview to see the letter of course then kultamani came back from his coast when we arrived his office he said since his arrival he could not involve himself in the case. The simple fact is, you know, uh, Lantom Montamba was threatening him that if he should involve himself in that case, he's going to lose his rank, according to him. And when he was saying it, I was not alone. I was together with my co-accused person. He said, now that the, the same headquarters have written to him to reinvestigate, let us be rest assured that he is going to reinvestigate the matter and come up with it you know, a tangible report. Then we told him that, okay, you know, our minds are at rest now, so long you are asked to reinvestigate. Because he knew us, we were working with him for quite a long, you know, for quite a long time. So there, we are, he called the complainant, and obtained his statements, and we also give a statement. That investigation is not even completed yet. One fine day, after working hours, which is you know unusual, after working hours, Mamatar Seka then the camp commandant, Mamatar Seka walked in, called the RSM and then asked the RSM to inform us that we are going to appear on orders. So when RSM you know approached me and told me, I said, "But sir, what is going on? This is working hour after working hours. How can you carry an orders after working hours?" He said, "Look." He was only there to inform me that let me prepare. I said, okay. The RSM I created is RSM Sise. His first name, Musa Sise. So we prepared, we put on our uniform, and then we went to Kulutomane's office. He was the OC military police at the time. He read the charges to us that, you know, scandalous misconduct, whether we are guilty or not. We said we are not guilty. He referred the matter to Camp Commandant. From his office, we went to Camp Commandant's office. You know, 
come commander also read the same text to us that you know we are charged you know scandalous misconduct and then whether we are guilty we said no we are not guilty the funny thing is we are not even allowed to explain our side of the story he said he was called by Lan Tombon Tamba that I should be dismissed from the army, handed over to the police for prosecution. I said, sir, we have procedures in the army. If I offended, let's follow those rules and regulations, those procedures. I'm not working for Lan Tombon. How can you say Lan Tombon said I'll be dismissed? I'm not working for Lan Tombon. So how can you, he said, I proved to be stubborn, but I, was, I don't know what is ahead of me. I said, okay. He said he dismissed us, handed from his office to a waiting car straight to police headquarters. We arrive at the police headquarters. We arrive at the police headquarters. This was in the evening, around after seven towards eight in the evening. So it was very unusual for the police to receive such a caliber of people without being informed. They said they are not going to accept us. I saw the duty officer that, look, we are law-abiding citizens. We didn't did anything wrong, allow us to be here. He said, no, he cannot put us inside. He said, he said yes, it's all right. We can be behind the counter until daybreak. Then your superiors will have been in the office. And he also did exactly what I told him. He keep us behind the counter. We were there until the following morning. When Jesus then, his uh, body was the IGP. When he came, we were escorted to his office. He started asking us what happens. We said, well, we don't know. He said, your dismissal is, I cannot understand the way you guys are dismissed. He said, well, just take it in good faith, you know, you know as, as, as man, you know, whatever comes to your way, you take it. We said, it's all right. So long we know what we did, we didn't do anything wrong. Also, we obtained, they obtained statements, we are charged, we spent three days, the fourth day, we were paraded before the high court. That's where I even, come to see my informant. He was also arrested alongside with two others who came to be Manka Mansane and then uh, Ahmad Bailo Kamara, who was a taxi driver then. So we are all charged alongside conspiracy and robbery with violence. You know, we were denied bail because they said it's unbailable. So we had to get to my two. We were reminded you know, and also we are told we have to look for a counsel for ourselves, lawyers for who are going to represent us because it's a criminal matter, we cannot stand for ourselves. You know, at that point in time, you know, what, what lawyers are charging, you know, my brother, I cannot afford it. 150,000, where would I get that? So thank God I secured a lawyer, a service of a lawyer, you know, who represented me throughout the marathon trial. Who was he? Uh, Borituri. Barista Borituri. You know, we remained in prison for four years, six months, ten days on trial until on the November 6, 2012, we were acquitted and discharged from the, from the court. So the following day, I went together with the, my co accused person to meet our lawyer. No, we instructed him to write to the army you, for our reinstatement. Five of you were charged. Yes. Who was your co-accused? You you referring to? Yeah, Balamusa. We are all military police personnel. But First, last name, please. Balamusa Sidi. Okay. So we instructed the lawyer to write to the army for our reinstatement because, you know, according to the allegations, it's not it's not true. Uh, the lawyer also wrote to the army for our reinstatement. Uh, and then the, he also got a reply from the army that they still have the right to uh, try us on military court martial. Do you have the necessary documentation? Yes, Your have, order of acquittal, the judgment order of acquittal, yes, and this the, letter you're talking about? Yes, I have that. Could you produce them to the commission, please? Uh, I understand you made copies. Yes. Send, send both the originals and the, the copies. Photocopies.
you kindly pass the judgment uh, and the letter uh, of uh, Bodhi Ture from Crown Chambers uh, written to uh, Defence Headquarters. Mr. Chair, we would uh, request that the uh, judgment uh, of the High Court uh, by Justice, Court of Appeal Justice, uh, uh, Honorable Justice Amijouf, uh, judgment dated 6 November 2012, be added in the record as Exhibit 30. Uh, should, 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 should that be accepted as Exhibit 30 and uh, the letter from Crown Chambers dated 12 December 2012 be also included in the record as Exhibit 31. Request granted, Council. Uh, may I also ask that the Commission accepts the photocopies of these documents and return the originals to, to the owner. Request also granted. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. So, Mr. Witness, uh, the, you, your lawyer wrote to the Army. Yes. Uh, and uh, what did the Army say? Uh, as I said, the Army replied uh, with threatening, because I will see that as a threatening. You know? So when I received the letter from I went to the lawyer, when he gave me the letter, I went through it. I feel very uncomfortable to be, to stay here. I decided to go on exile. I went to Dakar, I was in Senegal. Uh, Mr. Witness, perhaps uh, I should just read out a portion of the letter written by the army to Crown Chambers, uh, informing them of their position on the request for reinstatement. The last paragraph, uh, the penultimate paragraph states as follows. Quote, the action of GAF was motivated by the revelations in our investigations, which were cogent, consistent, compelling, and lead to an irresistible conclusion that the accused persons extorted money from the complainant please find attach a copy of the investigation report and the, and the legal opinion that ensued. Note that we still reserve the right to try them in court martial. Paragraph five. I hope this letter will awaken their senses to allow sleeping dogs lie, unquote. Signed, Baho Rejaite, Major for Chief of Defense Staff. It's quite extraordinary that a person's been acquitted and discharged, and the Army still think that they could try the person on the same charges under court martial. But having received this letter threatening potential court martial, if you do not let sleeping dogs lie, what did you do after that? See, how can I allow the sleeping dog like after my throughout my youthful age I served in the army for twenty years and you just wanted to go like that? Where would I where would I pick up from there? All my life is in the army. And this is the place I know. Look. Up till now, my twenty years is in the air like that. No benefit. What did you do after receipt of this letter? Yeah, I, 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 I fled. I went to Senegal, you know, in Dakar. Why, said, why did you have to go to Senegal? Maybe you don't know. I have gone far with these people. I know the type of people I'm dealing with. What type of people were you dealing with? They're just crazy people, monsters, you know, who are bloodthirsty, you know. Yeah. Those are the kind of people that were in the army? That's what you're suggesting? No, but not, I'm not saying in the army, in, in the army then. What I'm trying to say, the government in place at that time. All right? And 
Maybe in my other appearance, you start to know what I'm trying to tell you. All right? So the mere fact that, you see, you can see, why are they refusing? Now, as I'm speaking to now, my co-accused party is in the army. He's reinstated. When was he reinstated? As soon as the impasse, after the impasse, he was reinstated back in the army, and he's working. So... Did you make an appeal to be reinstated? Yes, I went to the headquarters many times. You know, what I was told that there will be a board, you know, sitting who will look into our cases. But then... Do you know how your co-accused came to be reinstated? When I asked, they said it is an executive order from President Barrow that he should be in the army because during the impasse, they are the people with the president. This is what they t told me, which is very unfair. To be quite honest, who am I? W what have I done? What is the difference between, sorry, what is the difference between me and him? We are all accused of the same offense. So even when I was uh, you know, in Senegal, do they know what, what, what part do I play? They don't know. What did you go to do in Senegal? What did I? Go to do in Senegal. Why did you have to go to Senegal? No, like I, you know, I went to Senegal in order to myself in order to add my voice, you know, to what is happening back home, and I was definitely doing that. You were afraid that you would be court-martialed. Yes, I'd be court-martialed. I'm afraid of that, to be quite honest. You fled. Yes, I fled. So you returned after the impasse. After the election, yes. After the election. Yes. And you tried to be reinstated? Yes. And you did not succeed? I did not succeed. And you think, you think that is unfair? It's unfair. It's unfair. Because even if I, not to, if I, even if I'm not going to be reinstated, but at least give me a reason that is, you know, genuine enough, at least, or give me my benefit, I go. Mr. Ba, I have no further questions for you. I give you another rendezvous sometime in the future. Okay. Months to come, you will right. come back here to testify about the other subjects okay, that thank, we mentioned. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Mr. Chair, the witness. Thank you very much, Chairman Council. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ba, for your testimony. Commissioners, do you have any questions? Matu? Put to Mr. Ba. If not, Council, we would um, uh, end it, um, uh, this afternoon's summer proceedings, and I believe uh, we would um, uh, come tomorrow morning, unless you have something else lined up um, for the afternoon. Do you? Uh, this afternoon, the Chair has a meeting, an important meeting, outside the offices of the Commission, so there won't be any hearing this afternoon. I thought I wasn't going to be exposed um, uh, <laughs> for the cancellation of the meeting. It is with the Attorney General and the Minister of Justice, and it concerns some um, The I'll Chair see. said it, oh, not cancel. <laughs> well, uh, you exposed me. Uh, but uh, so there wouldn't be any meeting this afternoon. Uh, we would come back here tomorrow morning, 10 o'clock sharp. Thank you all for coming. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you.